Welcome to another episode of the Morning Buzz. Hi, I'm your host, Russell Gahagan, and this is Russell Fishing Tech's Morning Buzz. This is brought to you by Torquey Coffee. If you're like me and you're getting up early for that morning bite and you need a little help uh, being attentive right off the bat uh, in the morning for that early fishing bite, check out Torquey Coffee. Uh, This week's guest is Captain Bob Songen of Real Excitement Fishing Charters. Uh, Captain Bob fishes both... Wilson at the bar, and he also fishes Oak Orchard on Lake Ontario. Bob, how are you doing today? Pretty good, Russell. Thanks for having me. Hey, no problem. I really appreciate it. Bob is somebody who I've known now for quite a few years. Um, I've had an opportunity to speak with Bob at uh, the Niagara Falls event um, a while back and, and enjoyed that. We've sort of become friends over the years, which has been been some fun. So why don't you kind of start off by telling the folks at home sort of how your season goes. Uh, you start in Wilson, you put your boat in there in the spring, and then that transitions to Oak Orchard and how that all works out. Yeah, you, you step ahead of yourself. I actually started at Oak Orchard. I okay. started, my, yeah, my boat goes in. As soon as the ice is out, I fish brown trout at Oak Orchard for okay. the first three to four weeks of April. And then usually the last week of April, I uh, head down to Wilson and fish the Niagara Bar for salmon for the whole month of May. Sometimes in the first week of June, depending on how things are going down there. And then after that, I head right back to the Oak and finish my uh, the rest of my summer out till, the, till September at Oak Orchard. Okay, now that's an interesting um, question that I want to start off with because we had um, Jake Romanak from Fishing 411. I'm not sure if you know Jake or not, but we had him on last week, and he was just he was praising the fishing um, at the bar, basically, uh, for the entire season. So what makes you go back to the oak after you're done, you know, like you said, like, you know, in the June time frame, uh, what sort of makes you go back to the oak? What draws you to the oak? Is that just your natural home port, or do you think the fishing's better there later in the year, or how does that work? Well, number one, start this is Oak Orchard is my home port. So uh, my main dock is there, and I'm pretty comfortable there. One of the reasons I fish Oak Orchard in the summertime is that I, I believe that the water coming in out of uh, Niagara River as Lake Erie warms has a bigger effect on the salmon and does push them out and offshore and down to, actually down towards Oak Orchard. One of the things about the Oak Orchard area is actually the furthest north point on the lake uh, on the shoreline to the lake in the western basin of Lake Ontario. It's the fastest place to get to the deepest water on the whole western basin. We only need to go like six, seven miles out, and we're in the over 500 foot of water. So when those fish start moving offshore and we're targeting steelhead mixed in with salmon in the, in the summer time frame, July and August, it's a lot easier and quicker to get to those fish. Okay, well, that makes that makes good sense, um, and that's an interesting fact. So now, that since we're talking about kind of that summer time frame and that warmer water, deeper program, one of the things that I've always thought was a little bit unique about um, Lake Ontario, or at least a good section of it, is that, you know, a lot of guys talk about using real deep coppers, and I know me watching your fishing reports, as adamantly as I do, I know you talk a lot about, you know, your wire divers real deep, your downriggers real deep. So there definitely becomes a period of time in the summer where you're fishing primarily deep. Is that because the water has warmed up? And if so, kind of when is that period of time? Well, typically uh, through June, <laughs> early July, a uh, water stays pretty, pretty cool, pretty cold. Um, when we start getting a lot of northwest winds, at the, at the Oak Orchard area, it starts pushing the warm water in, okay, as it pushes that warm water in, of course, it pushes, at the same time, it's pushing the cold water out, and a lot of them salmon start following that cold water out, um, and uh, we typically start moving offshore mid-July. We do fish fairly deep, We're not, I'm not afraid to fish cold water, I mean, every day, I start my, I sent my set of pro, pro rigger down where I find 42 degrees and I work my program from there. Sometimes you got to go down 80, 90, 100 feet to get down to find that temperature. As uh, I'm, I watched a couple other of your shows that some of the other captains have mentioned, don't be afraid to fish in cold water. 
those fish are down there. Um, I've uh, I've worked with the DEC quite a bit on a focus group and some studies that they've done. Uh, they've tagged salmon, and salmon will go go down to 300 foot of water and come up four or five times a day to feed. So when they're down there in that cold water, they not and they get ready to feed. They're not afraid to bite in that cold water. Yeah, I would I would agree 100 percent with that. So that, that's sort of an interesting interesting take on that. So let's let's kind of rewind now. So let's start with your spring brown trout fishing. You're starting that off at the oak. Uh, I'm assuming that's 25 foot of water and in. Kind of run us through what your spring brown trout looks like. Kind of. Uh, you know, what types of rods are you running, boards, divers, yada, yada. And if you've kind of got some specific types of tackle, like spoons or stick baits or something that you you prefer running over other stuff. Well, typically when we're fishing brown trout out of the oak area, we're fishing 15 feet or less. Sometimes the closer, if you can get in, there's areas where we can get them real tight to shore where it's still fairly deep, eight, nine feet, you know, for the browns. Uh and I typically like to fish west of the harbor. All those are fish east and west, but I just got this habit that west is best, and I feel comfortable down there. Uh, also, to the west of Oak Orchard, we've got Johnson's Creek and a couple other small creeks that are always bring in color. As you know, color is important for brown trout fishing, very important. Uh, we know back in the 80s, we had a lot of color, but as things changed and zebra mussels came in and uh, the clear water acts came into, came into effect, uh, our water cleared up pretty quickly. So we pretty much depend on s some wave action or water coming in from the tributaries to give us that color to catch fish. And again, like I said, we typically fish 15, probably more 12 to 8 than anything else. Uh, it's always good to fish right after we get a little bit of a blow because we always know there's going to be color coming in off the shoreline. I mean, typically, I'm pretty simple. I run nine rods. Three rods on each side off my boards and uh, three downriggers. And I'm not afraid to run the center downrigger only 10 or 12 feet back. Those fish will, will let it let it go on them tight riggers in the prop wash. Typically, uh, I set up my – I run seven-foot rods all the time. Uh, I like a seven-foot one-piece rod. And uh, typically in the springtime, fishing for browns, I want to – uh, lighten up my tackle, a little more stealth presentation. I usually strip off about 100 foot of my 20 foot pound, 20 pound test line, and I put on uh, 100 foot of 15 pound fluorocarbon. And uh, that's pretty much what I run off my boards. Uh, I'm a stickler for body baits, three and a half inch body baits, no matter what kind they might be. Uh, colored, when the water's real colored and murky, I lot, like hot colors, like fire tigers. Uh, hot oranges, hot red. Uh, as the water starts clearing a little bit, I'll go to a little lighter color uh, bait that's like a light green. Uh, and then as the water really gets clear, go more natural, silvers and golds. Uh, I always like to run another thing. I like a, a, an orange belly on everything I run. So if I have a silver, a silver, a black and silver bait, I'll take an orange magic marker and run it on the belly. I think that that's attracts some brown trout. Uh, we, uh, like I said, typically run along the shoreline. I run all spoons on my riggers, uh, usually five foot down. And like I said, the center rigger, I run close. Usually my out and downs are run back 50, 60 feet. I do, at times I will run divers and I do something different than most of the guys are doing. I tell you, I'm a slide diver fanatic. I've had the nickname Slide Diver Bob from a number of the captains over the years. I take my slide divers, pop the rings off of them, loosen them up, take the weight right out, put them back together, set them all the way on the side and run them out. And I run them back 50 feet up, 50, 60 feet off the divers and just run them off to the side of the boat, 10 to 15 feet. Those slide divers without the weight in them are the, with, and the where the weight would be pushed all the way down perpendicular to the to the short or the bottom, okay, they'll just slide out to only go down about four or five feet if you only let them out like 15, 20 feet, and they'll take some take some good fish too. I know some other guys run some other things with divers, but when I do run my divers, that's how I do do it. That's an interesting program for sure. So are you running larger planer boards then, you know, like the big boards, or are you running inlines? Uh, no, I run uh, larger boards. I run the uh, the um, outer boats uh, is what I run. Um, and uh, typically, 
the only time I, I will go over to inlines uh, is when it really gets dead calm and it gets crystal clear because I do believe them bigger boards at times will spook the fish. Okay, so uh, but most of the time I'm running big boards. Okay, um, so that's your March and April program, so to say, right? And then you said you're gonna you're gonna be heading to Wilson then in in early May, generally speaking. Or late April? Uh, usually the last weekend of April is when I, as soon as I finish my last weekend trips, I'm the first weekend of May, I'm fishing in Wilson. Okay. And does that usually turn on right off the bat, kind of right in May, just like clockwork, right? You know, almost all the time? Yeah. T- typically, you like to think it's gonna, but typically, like the first week we're down there, we get a real mixture of lake trout and some kings mixed in and cohos. Uh, there's, you know, Everyone pretty much knows that Niagara River in the wintertime attracts a lot of them lake trout and they get up in the river for spawning and then they start leaking back out in the lake as the lake starts warm as the lake starts warming a little bit. And that's usually it's a mixture of lake trout for me anyways, lake trout and salmon and fishing for some cohos up on the top. By by Mother's Day, them salmon get in there so heavy that I believe they kicked them lake trout right out of there. Then by, from Mother's Day on, it is nothing but kings. Kings with an occasional call on its surface. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I fished there for a tournament a few years back, and I kind of noticed the same thing. We made it a week-long trip, um, and the first couple days we were there, we had some lake trout mixed in with our box, and then the last four or five days, um, including the tournament, was just pretty much salmon, salmon, salmon. So, um Interesting how that how that perspective works. So when you're fishing that that Wilson area now, what is sort of the depth range that you're generally spe- fishing? I know that can, at least in my experience, that can be kind of wide. Um, you know, it can be maybe in way shallow, it can be out way deeper. But kind of give us an idea, you know, for the folks at home that are maybe thinking about heading to that Wilson area or maybe going to come book a trip with you. What sort of depths of water, generally speaking, are you fishing at the bar in that you know uh, May and early June time frame? Well, it's really driven by watercolor. Um, the, the watercolor coming out of that Niagara River is very green. Uh, typically, it's green all the time, and it depends what the wind does as far as moving that water around. A lot of times, especially mi- early early May, mid-May, you're, that water is fairly close and tight to shore. And uh, we usually fish in the 50, 60 foot range. We, we like to like to see that a lot of times. We don't have to go far. We, I go out there, throttle it up. Within a half a mile, I'm shut down and we're fishing. And my guys on the boat say, is, it, is this as far as we got to go? So they don't need to go any further than where the fish are. So uh, it really depends on that water color. Now, when we get uh, a strong, strong west wind or northwest wind, it pushes that water the, that green water coming out of the lake, I mean, out of the river, tied to the shore. And you can't miss it because when you hit the edge of that green water, it is crystal clear. You can see your cannonballs down 15, 20 feet. When you're in that right color green water, you put your cannonballs down five, six feet, they're, they're pretty much gone as far as the visibility on them. Then is, uh, if you get a strong south wind, of course, it starts pushing that greener water out further so it so it pushes the fish along with it, and then of course the the old northeast wind, which everybody hates uh, because it destroys the fish a lot. Typically, when we get a strong northeast wind, it ends up pushing the water back, the, that green water back towards the river and out deep. So sometimes you get some of that green water will break right off from the river water, and you get a big pool of green water out, maybe 400 foot of water to be loaded with salmon. But a lot of times. If you just get it, get out after a northeast wind, just get out, start heading west till you find that green water. You're going to find it sooner or later. The current of the river stops that what that east wind from pushing the water back to the west. So if you make it to the river, 90% of the time you're going to find that green water. There's going to be salmon in it. So how far that, Bob, how, far, how far down do you think that green water goes? Well, I wish I. Wish I could tell you. I I believe it goes right to the bottom the re, because of the fact that that time of the year, be, being this river water, you'll have, say, 44 degrees on the surface, and you'll have 44 degrees down 100 feet. So I got to believe that that colored water is through that whole water column. Hmm. Interesting. That's an interesting take. And 
obviously in that green water, it's generally just loaded with bait fish as well, correct? Well, yeah, most definitely. That's the big driver. The bait fish come in, especially smelt. Salmon eat a lot of smelt early in the season. Uh, they run in, run up the river to, for their spawning process. As soon as they're done, they're slipping right back out on the lake. Salmon are on top of them, eating them. And on top of it, uh, alewives are looking for that warmer water as they come up from the depths in the 39-degree water. And once they move up in that warmer 41, 42, or higher water, them salmon zone right in, right in on them and come in for eating. So that's what I was wondering. So alewives are in there, smelt are in there. What other types of bait fish are in there? Uh, emerald shiners. There's usually a lot of – and the emerald shiners are the favorite – at that time, the favorite food of the cohos. And I'm shining, as you can see them on the surface, they're in that, you know, top surface water, 10 to 15 feet, and them cohos are right up there munching on them. A lot of times when you do catch a coho and we clean them at the end of the day, it looks like spaghetti in their belly because they've eaten so many Emerald Shiners. So that time of year, do you target the coho at all specifically, or do you just primarily fish kings and get the cohos by accident? Uh, typically, I do target the cohos, not with the major portion of my set, though. Typically, that time of the year, I'll be running five, uh, three down riggers, two divers, and then I'll run a five color, okay, with a, with a, everyone knows where the coho spinner is with a coho fly, a five color with a coho fly and a spinner off of, off of my boards, not out very far. Okay, and that's typically going to take my cohos. Me, my perfect mix in the springtime, give me give me six to eight kings and, and four to six cohos. That's a nice catch. You get the, the kings are the best eating that time of the year, and the cohos are always good eating, as we know. So my clients like to get some of the big ones, and they like to mix in a couple small ones that they know are going to be really good for table fare. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because that's something that, as fishermen, we probably don't talk about enough. When you go deer hunting um, or, you know, maybe you go to harvest some other types of game, you talk about the age of the animal and, the, you know, the quality of the meat and how good they taste, et cetera, et cetera, based on the age of the animal. But something we don't talk a lot about is, you know, when it comes to fish. And obviously, king salmon tastes good, like you said, you know, almost all sizes. But really, in my opinion, at least, there isn't anything better to eat on, on the Great Lakes than a uh, Two to six pound coho salmon. That's like the filet mignon of, of Great Lakes fish. Um, so I agree with you. It's like the customers can get six or eight of them drag screaming kings, and then they get four or six of them, you know, uh, cohos for the uh, delicacy. They got kind of the perfect all around catch. Most definitely. Most definitely. What, well, si- what, what size and type boat do you run? Tell, tell guys a little bit at home maybe about the type of boat that you have and, and, uh, and how you have that set up for charter fishing and, and getting customers and clients on fish. Okay. I've, I've got a 36 foot Tierra. It's got twin four fifty four gas engines in it. It's not very cheap to run, but it's very comfortable to fish out of. Uh, it's not the fastest boat in the world. I may get there five minutes later, but I'm going to catch it. Hopefully catch just as many fish as the guys that beat me there. Uh, but at this point in time, my clients and both me as I age, like a little more comfort, out on the lake, and that boat provides it for me. Uh, pretty much set up, I got five downriggers. Uh, the reason I have five downriggers is because at times I'll do I'll do things different. I may, depending on what the fish are doing, I typically start every day with running three or four of them, and then if the fish start getting skittish, I'll start pulling downriggers out of the water and just run maybe my two corners instead of my center rigger and two out and downs. And uh, I typically run uh, wire on my three riggers, but on my two corners, I run 200 pound power pro because I'm a firm believer and I'm sure everybody's heard it. That wire makes a lot of noise in the water and the deeper you fish, the more noise it makes. I don't, I don't believe that power pro makes the noise. So I, when I'm fishing real, real deep, I'm using that power pro on the corners, of course, and only fishing two down riggers when I'm fishing real, real deep takes less opportunity for me to get something tangled up. Uh, I'm a slide diver user. I've been using, like I said, they've nicknamed me slide diver, Bob. I've been using slide divers for 30, for as long as I can remember them being made. I can't remember for sure how long ago they started, but it's got to be 25 years I've been using slide divers. Uh, I do not run double divers on either side. I just run a single diver on each side. 
Typically, I start my day out with a black diver on one side and a white diver on the other side. I believe that so, there are times that a white diver will attract fish, okay, more than the black diver. We run white flashers all the time to attract fish. That white diver just additionally brings a little bit more attraction. What I'll do as the day goes on, if the white one starts working and the black one isn't, boom, I got whites on both sides. If the black one's working, the white one isn't, same thing. White one comes out and the black ones go in. Uh, and so that's my, in the springtime, that's my uh, main king setup. And like I said, then coho's out, out on the board. So on my outriggers, I do run outriggers too. Uh, so when the coho's gets, get tough to hook up, I like to run them on my outriggers because them outriggers snap them back pretty good and get them hooked up pretty good. So yeah. I would agree with that. And it's interesting that you mentioned that about the diver color, because it's something that I've sort of changed my mind on in the last 10 years. Rewind about 10 years, I was promoting very heavily black and clear divers, which I still think black and clear divers work very well to try to be stealthy, long lead behind the boat, yada, yada. And then what I sort of learned through just trial and error is that with as clear as the water has gotten, there is really no way to hide the diver anymore. I don't care how tricky you get, how far back you want to put it, whatever, you know, as well as I do, just like a cannonball on your downrigger or whatever. Um, if the water's crystal clean, uh, you know, they are going to see that diver. So I agree with you hundred percent on a given day, they may want a chrome diver. They may want a white diver. They may want a black diver. If you paint green dots on a diver, it may work better on a given day than another day. Um, so that is the tricky part about the way the lake is sort of, uh, developing and changing over the years, um, is that there is no way to hide that stuff. So they are definitely, you know, can become color oriented for sure. No doubt about it. Just a little added thing. Even if, if my white divers work in and I switch over the white diver on both sides, I'll leave, I even got a white cannonball just in case, and I'll put the white cannonball down the center and start catching fish on that. Do you, sometimes that's what they want, and sometimes that's all they want all day long. So, there's you know, like anything else with fishing, you got to be – you're always learning something. You always got to be flexible. Yeah, one of the things I think people don't think a lot about is they're thinking diver, cannonball, they're thinking fish feeding, and I don't know that that's necessarily the case. All you're trying to do with that type of stuff is draw attention, right? You're not catching them on the diver. You're not catching them on the cannonball, obviously. You're catching them on a fly or a spoon or whatever. But you want their attention. The minute you got their attention, you have a much better chance of catching them because now they've you've draw that, drawn them into your spread. And obviously, we don't know. I don't know because I've never scuba dived. I'm assuming you probably don't know either or haven't spent a bunch of time scuba diving, but the, the light penetration angle obviously can change things dramatically in the water, I'm sure. And on a given day, you know, a black might represent, uh, uh, you know, another salmon swimming around and a white might represent another salmon swimming around on a different day. Um, and that's where it's really interesting how those, uh, you know, different colors can really play a role in different days. So let's talk a little bit about, um, in particularly that, that bar area, again, what is sort of your go-to spread? Obviously you said you're fishing some boards, you're fishing some, you know, a diver on each side and you're fishing some riggers. You kind of mentioned you probably got some coho stuff on your boards. Um, you're probably king fishing primarily on your divers and riggers. Is it mostly a fly bite? Is it mostly a spoon bite? Is it mostly a meat bite? Is it all of them? Kind of run us through Generally speaking, at the bar, what 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 you're looking at for a bite in that May June time frame? Okay, I, I do. Well, we'll get this off first. I do run meat. Uh, I don't run meat if I don't have to. I am typically a flasher fly and spoon fisherman. Uh, typically, when I start every morning out, I'm going to put flasher fly on my divers, and I'm going to work my riggers with spoons. Early in, the, early in the season like that is in May, it's cold water, a lot of fish early are feeding high. So I usually like to get my spoons up in the, you know, 25, 35, 40, you know, 60, 40, 40, 30 to 60 foot range early. Okay. And uh, usually run them fairly tight right off the bat, you know, anywhere 10 to 12 foot. Uh, not afraid to uh, mix the spoons up. I'll, you know, like we all know, the fish tell us what you want, what they want. Uh, if the fish 
and I typically fish every day. So if the fish start wanting mag spoons, first thing I start every morning with is mag spoons. If they don't work, then I'll start switching the sizes around. I'll, I'll go to switching sizes more than switching colors. So if a, a specific, I, especially in Wilson, I find if a specific spoon is working, it's going to work. It may not be the same spoon every year, but whatever spoon we figure out down there that's working is going in the water. Now, if they don't want it necessarily as a magnum size, I'll pull it out and I'll put down a regular size. If they don't want that, I'll pull it, pull it out and put down a small spoon, see what they want before I start changing colors. So I'll manipulate the spoon size and I'll also start manipulating the the spoon, the length off of the uh, the cannonballs too before I start getting drastically starting to try and find a different color spoon. Of course, you know, you get in a habit when the sun's shining first thing in the morning, I'm going to run this color spoon. When it's overcast and it looks like it's going to be dark all day, of course, you're going to head to another color spoon. And typically it's like, you know, everyone said bright, bright, bright on bright days, dark on dark days seems to be the rule for me anyways. Uh, divers, like I said, I run slide divers. I typically start, when I set my slide divers up, I set them up with between the swivel and my wire, I run 20 foot a mile filament, a 40 pound test, so I can adjust where my bait is. So I'll set them up like eight foot back first thing if they don't go, and I'll start lengthening out the lead on the slide diver to see if I could get that go before I get drastic. It's about changing things up. Because like I said, when you fish every day, you end up getting a pattern that pretty much is, in my estimation, stays stable unless you have a drastic change in your conditions. Yeah, that's something I talk about a lot in my salmon school. I get guys to ask me, what water temperature do you look for for salmon? And I, a lot of times will joke and say the water temperature that they're swimming in. And and that's, I say that. That's right. Well, and I say that because I and I and I'm not I'm not taking shots at anybody here, so don't you know don't take this the wrong way, and nobody at home takes the wrong way. But there's guys that write books or give seminars or talks or whatever, and and I've seen it before, and they're like, you know, you want to find salmon in 42 to 46 degree water. If I had five dollars for every king that I caught that was colder than 42 or warmer than 46, I'd have a lot of money. Um, I'd be able to take you to a nice dinner, nice steak dinner, Bob, and, and we'd be able to have drinks all night. So um, my point of that is, is I tell, tell guys, I say every year they sort of set up in a temperature range in spring, you know, in that May, June time frame, just like they would at the bar. And if you can follow that water as it gets pushed around the lake, um, you'll generally speaking, you'll follow the fish. My whole point of that is I agree with you 100%. A pattern will set up on sort of color patterns and dots versus stripes versus heavy glow versus silver, um, whatever it may be. A pattern will set up for you at the bar. You'll figure that out that first weekend or second weekend of May, and that will likely last you right through June as long as there isn't any major changes. Um, and that's where I think guys, you know, who maybe don't have as much experience in our weekend anglers, you know, maybe don't realize that. Getting a wide arsenal of equipment and tackle is really, really important. Well, understanding how to use it is maybe just as just as important. So let me ask you a question. I think I've heard you say this before, but I'm not positive. When you run double spoons on a rigger, like a stacker or a slider, and I think I've heard you talk more about sliders, but I could be wrong on that. Um, do you like to run the same color bait, the standard and mag, or do you a lot of times run different color baits? No, I I do like running the same color bait. I will run a standard and a smaller one above it or a standard on a slider. And I never slide a magnum. I'll either slide the standard or the smaller style, okay? And always put the bigger one of however I'm setting that up on the main line. So I typically like running the same same colors, Exactly on that on sliders, and I do prefer sliders. That you know, there are times I will pin them to stack it, but I, per, I prefer sliding them. And I do I put them in different ways too. You know, there's a lot of theories on it. Uh, all the theories I had, I kind of got blown out of the water with the equipment I got now. But uh, 
used to be if you put it in first, it would be, it would run closer to the bottom lower, and if you put it in last, it would run higher above the bottom lower, according to the bow and the line, because everyone knows there's a bow coming out of out of the the the, uh, the rod that comes back to the cannonball, okay, and. That kind of went to the wayside with the equipment I got now because I can see exactly where my slider goes. And no matter how I set it up, if I put, if I say drop the cannonball five feet and then put the slider on, put it down in the water, when it starts, it's going to be closer to that bait, to the other bait. But as time goes on, it moves right up and always finds its same spot that in, in, the, in the rod, depending on how many feet you have out there. And if you put it in last, it does the same thing. It slides down to the same spot. Yeah, it should, It should, in theory, hit the bow in the line, and wherever the right. peak of the bow is is where it should stop. But um, right. it should, in theory. So I'm going to get to that in this conversation, um, and, and that being your equipment, because I've had some requests to talk about that. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. But the next thing I want to talk about is maybe the number one thing I think you bring to the podcast to, today, um, and you bring to everybody at home, which is, in my opinion, you're one of the pioneers, or at least that I've seen on Lake Ontario on live fishing reports. Now there's other guys doing it and I'm glad there is. Uh, I think everybody could do it and help each other out. But as far as like almost a daily report, um, I've been watching your reports of at the bar, you know, when you're in, uh, you know, Wilson and at the Oak, when you're in Oak Orchard now for, I don't know, as long as I've known you, which has got to be five, six, seven years, whatever it's been. And, and I don't know how long exactly you've been doing it, but it's been a while. Um, talk a little bit about that. Talk about how people at home can find you and, and how you're doing it. Um, and then just, you know, maybe go over sort of why you started doing that and, and, and how it helps people catch more fish. Okay, real, real quick history. Years ago, before the Internet was really, really strong, there was a guy that I found that had a posting board. And back then I was... I was working a full-time job and just fishing mostly the weekends like a lot of guys do. I come in every Monday morning before I started work, get on my computer, and I post a report well, about, about what my weekend was. Then a buddy of mine saw that, and him and his wife were retired, and they wanted to go further with it. So I let them take it over, and we named it At The Oak, and he asked me to give him information, plus he got another few other captains. Unfortunately, this individual passed away. When he passed away, I took it over totally. And then, of course, once once the Internet got so you got all the social networks on the Internet, it became much easier just to do the reports live. I watched your your show with your dad and I agree with your father 100 percent. OK, that modern technology has made fishing easier for everybody, especially the recreational fishermen. And that was my goal. My goal was, and still is, to help that recreational fisherman, when he comes out, at least have an idea what to run and where to fish. So he's not coming out blind. A lot of years ago, these guys used to come out and fish in 34 to 44 the water in the middle of July, never catch anything. Now they know they may have to go to 250 foot, at least to start to hopefully catch fish. The objective there is to make those recreational fishermen successful because the more successful those recreational fishermen are, the ch better chance I can benefit by them going home and telling a friend what a great time they have fishing at Oak Orchard and their friend may not have a boat and he might call me or another charter captain to take a fishing. So it was to promote the area and give the area a good name, which I think has been pretty successful doing. Uh, and... Uh, Give the right, like I said, give the recreational fisherman an opportunity to have a good time when he comes out, and he may not necessarily catch as many fish as the as the captains do because a lot of captains are doing it every day. But it's good for him to come out and at least be able to catch some fish. You know, sometimes three or four fish in a day for a recreational fisherman that's fishing four hours is makes his day, makes his weekend. And that was the objective. And that's hopefully what I keep bringing to, to, to my reports. Yeah. One of the things I thought about your reports and I've, I've found um, important and you've been honest about it is exactly that transparency. Um, and, and there's some other guys now that have sort of followed along and are doing the same thing and I respect them as well, but I can't tell you how many charter captains I've seen over the years who only report when the fishing's good. And I know in a lot of ways, guys think that that's, well, of course they're going to do that. But 
that's not how it is. I mean, anybody who truly knows anything about fishing at all, even if you're just a person that goes out on a charter once a year, you know that you don't catch them every time. So if anybody gives that sort of inclination that you are catching them every time you go out, it's just not true. So I've always appreciated the fact that, you know, you've been up front. I mean, I can remember some specific days where, you know, it was hot. You were you were red in the face. You got sunburned, and you were you were truthful and said, "Listen, we just we just didn't catch them today. You know, we got a couple or whatever, but it just it just didn't happen for us. Uh, we're gonna get back out there and try again tomorrow. And then you know, a lot of times tomorrow you got them. But um, you know, that's what's important about you know for people at home to understand is that that information is just invaluable um, because even even myself, I mean, I'm not out there every day. So if I didn't have the resources and the um, you know, ability to gather information like I did, it would be much, much more difficult um, for me to have successful trips day in and day out uh, if there wasn't individuals like yourself who were out there on a daily basis being willing to share information. So uh, really appreciative that you're doing that for everybody over there. I depend on it just as much. If I have a tough day, I'm checking every one of the charter captains I know that fished that day to see, to see if they found a better place to fish. Okay, so... You know, even like you said, I'm not going to lie. Fishing's tough. It's tough. And sometimes it's not tough for one day. Sometimes it's tough for multiple days. And when it's good, I'll tell you it's good. Sometimes I'll say, you better get out here right now because I don't know how long it's going to last, but it's as good as it gets. And so, and then sometimes I'll say it is it is what it is. But like I said, I it is important for me to get that information and it is for me to present that information to everybody else. Absolutely. So let's talk about you know, we're, we're, we're sort of getting toward the, the later part of the show here. And let's talk about for maybe five to 10 minutes, because I know we could probably talk about this all day, but let's talk for five to 10 minutes about this electronics. You're one of the few guys, at least maybe there's more than a few, but a few guys that I'm aware of on Lake Ontario running the Garmin um, Panoptics, uh, you know, basically the ability to see you know, far away from your boat and see down a ways with your electronics on the Great Lakes. Um, there's, you know, there's there's probably some individual weekend fishermen or whatever are, but from a charter captain's standpoint, I don't know anybody personally on Lake Michigan that has it. I know yourself, Captain Casey Prisco, and I think maybe one other on Lake Ontario that have it. Let's talk about that a little bit. I, I know that was somewhat new for you this year. I'm not even sure if you have all the weapons uh, at your disposal that you were hoping to have, but tell us what you saw in the first year of that thing, and, and in all honesty, because I know you are an honest guy, and that's why I can ask you this: Is it worth the two to three thousand dollars that something like that costs for the people at home? Uh, you know, in your first year of what you saw, did you feel that you got a big advantage with that electronics? You want me to give you that answer first? Sure. <laughs> that, answer, that answer first is: If I had to get rid of every other piece of equipment on my boat, except for my downriggers and rods and reels and baits. Any other piece of electronics, I don't care what it is, that is the one piece of electronics I would keep. The bad, the bad thing about it, it's not very useful when I'm running out looking for fish. Okay? Uh, it, it doesn't, number one, it's, a tra it's only a transom mount device for what I'm using and what Casey's using. Uh, so basically, you get all that turbulence back there. You can't see anything when you're running. So you really need standard type of sonar equipment to try and find if you're looking for bait and fish as you go as you're running out with uh, uh, through all transducer the first for the finest starting point sometimes but as far as when you slow down or start trolling it is astonishing what you can see down there what you thought what you didn't even think was going on okay for te for years i had do, this bad i had done a, a little uh Little work, a friend turned me on to the inline cameras. I'm sure you know what those are. When you put the the, the torpedo like cameras in line and yep. saw some so caught a couple of fish like that, saw some crazy things down there, watching fish come. Unfortunately, you can't see it live. But when you saw the recording come back, you could see how many times a fish came up and swiped at your bait, how many times they missed it. Well, with the pan optics, you could see that. You may not necessarily see them actually swiping at your bait, but you can see them swim up and look, okay? And if they don't like that one, you can watch them swim to another one and bite it, okay? Uh, it's been a great benefit as far as 
landing success rate because of the fact I will be able to tell a client, I occasionally run with the first mate or the first mate that I have, go and stand at that downrigger and watch it because there's a fish watching it and he's going to bite it. And he go, when it goes off, he is on top of that rod, able, able to reel the slack in and hook that fish up, whether it be a client or my first mate. Uh, it also allows you to see fish. I see fish coming up, swimming, looking at my bait and swimming away. Well, there's something wrong with the bait because they're not biting it. Is the bait too close to the cannonball? Should it be closer to the cannonball or should I change it? So sometimes I'll change the bait. When I change the bait, I'll see fish stop looking at it all together. So now I know I went the wrong direction. So now I'll go back either put that bait back in or go to a bait similar and maybe, like I said, change the length on it to try to get them to strike. Another thing it allows you to do is what I call tactics. Buddy of mine, great fisherman, Dave Siegfried uh, from Tracker Charters, is a, full, a crazy way tactic. Speed the boat up, turn it right, turn it left, slow the boat down, jump it ahead. Well, when you see a fish swat following, okay, you can do those things. You could speed the boat up, try and get him to strike. Slow the boat down, try and get him to strike. Good. And he'll stay there. You could see that fish following. One thing I've learned that I've caught more fish doing it this year because of pan optics. I walk, I'll see a fish follow, follow, follow. I'll walk over, tell my first mate, go over there, bring that downrigger up. That downrigger start coming up, comes up 15 feet, and the fish slams it. That fish will follow it right up and take it because he thinks that bait's trying to get away from him. Uh, it, the, the information it gives is invaluable. One of the other things it does do, it allows you to see fish that are inactive. And, as, and you don't want to fish them inactive fish. If you're going over fish and all you're doing is marking them, basically you're still rock, marking nothing but red marks. And they're sitting there, those fish are inactive. You're not going to get them to bite. Okay, so now it's time to keep on moving to another area to see if you can find fish that are active. And you'll see that they're active with their pan optics. You see those fish swimming from cannonball to cannonball, head out towards your towards your your, uh, your divers, come back in, flash through, run to the front of the boat. It's it's unbelievable what you can see. Like I said, it's probably, I, it cost me $2,500 for the unit. The transducer is the most expensive part of it. Transducer runs about fifteen hundred dollars. The display runs approximately a thousand, and it's been an invaluable. And I don't even—I don't think I've even touched, touched that, that technology, that piece of equipment. What I think I can do with it. So it's been a learning process all along. And I don't—I'm not on Garmin's Pro Staff. Believe me, I'm not promoting their equipment because there's any reason I'm going to benefit from it. I'm only promoting it because of, of the information it provides. Bob, did you see the same stuff in the green water on the bar as you saw in the clear water out in, out in the lake? With the pan optics? Yeah. I can't give you that answer because I didn't get it till June. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I was, I was really, you know, last year, as tough as it was to get pieces of equipment, yeah, well, I, ordered, I ordered that thing, I ordered the transducer in, in April, and it didn't show up until mid-June. So, okay. unfortunately, I'm looking forward to, the, to that, believe me, to see that in May. But uh, just judging for the half a month of June, July, and August, what I saw with that unit, it's I I'm surprised I was able to fish without it. I've, it's, I've learned so much information from it. It's interesting. And you hit on one key topic that I talk a lot about in seminars and, and videos and stuff, which is understanding how to read electronics to know if you're inactive fish or not. And I talk a lot about, you know, like an upside down J um, versus just a, uh, you know, ordinary J mark versus just an old school upside down U. You know, the upside down U is a non-active fish that's just parallel, not moving in the column. Your big J mark like this, or even if it's a mark going down, he got spooked and he went down. The, the reality of that is he's active. He's moving around. He didn't like what he saw. He moved around. You're not going to catch every one you troll by. Um, but at least those fish are moving around. They're active. They're in and out of the spread versus just your standard stag stagnant marks. Those are generally not what you want to see if you're going to have a good day of successful day of fishing. So um, the issue with that is and why what you're talking about it actually has a lot more play than what 
people would think is if you want good electronics to see what I'm telling you right now, it's going to cost you $2,500 or more minimum um, to have, you know, a good piece of Garmin or Hummingbird or Lowrance or whatever it may be with a really good quality transducer, whether it be transom or through hull, to be able to see those active fish marks, you're going to be in that same price range or more. So that, you know, as as there's more competition now, Lowrance has a live series, uh, Hummingbird has a mega live. As there's more competition now, I think what we're all going to see is that price point's going to, you know, maybe maybe not have come down, but it's not going to go up as fast as the other electronic which will make it all affordable in general. So um, really interesting information, really interesting tactics. Um, and I think that'll be uh, really important for, you know, guys to understand. So we'll finish this up a little bit with talking about a product I'm pretty excited about, Bob, that was named after you um, about four or five years ago in the Niagara show, maybe even a little longer or something like that. I did a special run of flashers, like six, eight colors um, when I was there that were sort of exclusive to the show. And you picked a bunch of those up and you happened to have a ton of success with a couple of them. And last year you had, a, you know, a ton of success with them and you were calling me looking to get more and we ha we weren't making that color. Um, so I, I got you a couple of them just to try to get you by. And now, now we, uh, we came out with those in the 2022 lineup, which is the, Songans Green Bam and the Songans Chrome Bam, Bam Flashers. Um, this is the green version. Uh, it's got half UV tape, half crushed glow, and then the same thing on the opposite side with green and black dots on it. Um, and then we also got that available in the chrome, uh, which is where the you know Songans Green and Songans Chrome comes from. Talk a little bit uh, to some of the people at home. Where were you running these? Were you running them in Wilson? Were you running them at the Oak? Were you running them both? And were they riggers? Were they divers? Was it everywhere? You know, where were you seeing these particular baits really shine for you? Well, if I could have got more from you, they would have been everywhere. <laughs> okay. well, that's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah. But um, we, I actually started running them about two years ago. I think it was, I think it was four years ago I got them from you. And I don't know why I didn't run them sooner. I hooked them up with the, the – they got the nickname BAM because I hooked them up with the BAM Fly, as you know. Um, we started two years ago. I had a couple only. I gave one to my buddy that I fish with every day, and I kept one. And we started running them with the BAM Fly. And since that day in 2020, we have run that, except for when we're brown trout fishing, from May – to September every year, every day, the green one every year, every day catches fish every year. I mean, every day of the week that we run it and we run it every day and we run it uh, definitely on a, di on a diver. It's a great diver bait. Uh, of course we put the diver wherever it may have to be due to the conditions, but it has been guaranteed to catch both of us at least two to four fish every day. And uh, especially in the morning. And if uh, that green one stops working, the only reason it'll stop working is if the sun gets real high and the lake gets real flat. And then we switch right over that chrome and that chrome picks right up where the green one let off. And well, I've moved them to the down rigger, to, to my riggers. It's worked on my riggers. I've moved it to coppers. It works on coppers. Uh, and then, like I said, it works on the divers. And we run, I have, it will be, when I go to Wilson in May, it will be the first bait that goes in the water. That's how much confidence I got in it. Um, I've, you know, I'm going to say this, and there's going to be guys out there say, I bought that damn thing. It doesn't work. I can't guarantee every bait's going to work for everybody. We know that, okay? I've had guys come up to me for my reports. I've had guys fish with me. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a little story, not to get off the track on this, but some guys came from Michigan last year. They usually fish up in Canada, couldn't fish in Canada because of the COVID thing, came and fished with me. And they brought two baits on, two flashers on it, and asked me to sign them because they never caught a fish with them. And I've caught hundreds of fish with the same flashers. But getting back to the BAMs, like I said, it will be the first, both me and my buddy Bob, it will be the first bait that goes in the water when we start salmon fishing every day. We will set the diver with that bait before we put our downriggers in. Okay. And then, like I said, it got the, it got called the band. The reason 
one of the buddies that one of my buddies I know called you last year and asked for a band flasher. Did he not? And you didn't know what it was well, I know at, that time, at that time. Okay. No. So uh, I'm glad that you have it now. I would suggest anybody that uh, want that wants to be successful, at least try one probably. It's always bad to buy one because if it works, then you're really kicking yourself in the butt because you don't have a second one to put in. OK, but uh, I have a high level of confidence in that debate and would not tell anybody not to buy it. Let's put it to you that way. And thank well, you for finally getting them out there. <laughs> it's, got, uh, it, it's got all the recipes for success. I mean, the two face pattern, which is what this basically is, has been right. a on Lake Michigan and Lake Ontario for years. Um, when I made this, the thought process was UV was becoming the hot deal, you know, four or five years ago. Crush Glow has always been the hot deal. I was like, you know, why don't we put the two together, which is what we did here. Gives it a unique deal. We also did something a little different. Um, you know, Pro King has the red eye on their flashers. We haven't done any red eyes on any of ours, but we did put them on the BAM. So something just a little bit different than a lot of the other flashers out there. Not not all of them have an eye on them or whatever. So it's, it's fun. But for me, it's fun because um, I don't get to talk a lot about or I don't talk a lot about how blessed I am to have an opportunity to have a really wide group of individuals that I get to talk to and share information with. And, and even if it's only two or three, four times a year, you and I get a chance to call or text back and forth or whatever, but that's why the, how this fishery develops and how, you know, people become better. And, you know, it's amazing how there will be, there will be hundreds and maybe a thousand King salmon will, will go in a cooler to this in 2022 because of you, which started because I made it and you, you made it famous um, but that's my point is it's interesting always how those stories become right. along. and guys like myself, like yourself and other people in the, in, in the industry, you know, developing these products and promoting them is what helps people catch fish. There will be right. guys who will go to Lake Ontario will have bought this and this will make their trip guaranteed. I, I heard you said that already. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like you, like you said, um, There'll be guys that won't have success with it because it just didn't work for them or whatever, but there'll be guys that will buy that, will go there, and I'll get a message or you'll get a message. You'll say, I caught, you know, seven of the ten kings I caught were on that particular bait. So it's a ton of fun. Um, sure appreciate you joining us here on the Morning Buzz, Episode 15, with Captain Bob Songen from Real Excitement Charters. Bob, tell them where they can find you for your fishing reports and if they want to book a charter. Okay, my fishing report, I do it on Facebook. Uh, I do it both on my personal page and my real excitement page. Uh, some people follow me on both pages, so I want to make sure, or individual pages, so I want to make sure they all get the information. So it's just Robert Songen uh, for my personal page, and like I said, Real Excitement Charters uh, for my business page. Both of those places, if you want, I am online at realexcitement.com uh, if you want to reach me. Uh, my phone number and my email address and Everything you need to know is there. Uh, all my information as far as what my boat, the equipment, what I provide, what we fish for at different times of the year. And one more thing. Can I say one more thing? Absolutely, if somebody yeah. buys that BAM flasher and it doesn't work, you got my address on the website. Send it to me. I'll run it. <laughs> well, once again, this is Captain Bob Songen. From Real Excitement uh, Sport Fishing Charters, I'm Russell Gahagan, and this is episode 15 of the Morning Buzz. I hope you enjoy it. It was a real fun one for me. I think we were able to talk a little bit about that electronics thing, which is something I've been I've been getting requested for for a long time. And I think you were able to provide some some great information for some Lake Ontario fishermen and some Lake Michigan fishermen that want to try some Lake Ontario tactics. So check out the Morning Buzz with Russell's Fishing Tech on YouTube, Russell's Fishing Tech channel. This is episode 15 with Captain Bob Songen. I'm Russell Gahagan. We're out. <laughs>